Great. Thank you. Um, thank you, everyone. Thank you, VDAC and your fantastic team at Barrel Elites for putting together such a great conference. Uh, it takes a lot of planning and to make everything go so smoothly as it is today. Um, today's uh, lunch discussion, we're going to be focusing on uh, allocators and managers' uh, perspective of the changing investor landscape and uh, how to implement alternative investment classes into their uh, portfolios. Um, it's good to do a panel after the audience is well-fed and caffeinated and pumped up, so hopefully the, you'll be even more focused. <laughs> studies, uh, studies show that um, panels during lunch, what happens is 25% of you will focus on the panel, maybe 25% of you will think about things you have to do later, and half of you will be focused on your lunch. The good thing is, no matter what we say here today, at least half of you will have enjoyed our talk, so, it's, uh, so we'll keep that in mind. Um, in terms of um, logistics, we have 40 minutes on this panel. Uh, it'll go on until 2. Uh, first, I'm going to pass it on to our panelists. I'd like uh, each panelist to take the time to introduce themselves and talk about uh, what their focus is, um, starting on my left, your right, um, with Shihan. Shihan? Uh, sure. Th uh, no, it should be on. Uh, my name is Sihan Shu. I run a discretionary macro strategy in New York. Uh, I'm Arthur Bird. Uh, I run uh, General Quantive, which is, as the name implies, is a quantitative hedge fund focused on risk-driven investment strategies. And prior to that, I spent a number of years in various uh, research and strategy roles uh, at uh, larger firms. And I am Louisa Ives. I'm a managing director, and I oversee um, our external manager group within Chilton Trust. And we are a $5 billion wealth advisory firm um, located up and down the East Coast. So this is a really exciting panel, because we are going to have the perspectives uh, from three different uh, types of investors, uh, with Sihan being a discretionary global macro manager, uh, with Arthur being um, someone who is quantitative and systematic focused, and Louisa, who has more of a broad mandate to look at across all asset classes. So before we jump in to hear their views, I just want to lay out you know, what the landscape is, what we've seen uh, so far you know, leading up to this point. Uh, following the introductory comments that uh, Vidak made at the start of the conference, as he laid out you know, a lot of what's going on in the world today, um, there's a lot of great things as we see stock markets globally are at record highs, uh, labor markets are very strong, but the wall of worry is, continues you know, to mount even higher. Um, there's a lot of questions about what's going on with the trade war. There seems to be a lot of positive news that's been uh, good for the markets, but still you know, phase one has, uh, remains unsigned. There's a lot of debate negotiations going on now in November about um, topics of enforceability, technology transfer, the intellectual property rights, and it seems that as much good news that's out there, you know, none of this stuff is actually signed yet. There'll be still a lot of debate. A lot of people think that the U.S.-China trade war is going to go on for a long time. There's still a lot of uncertainty around uh, corporate capex decisions, uh, also the implications about uh, tariffs and as that affects supply chains and the consumer. There's a lot of debate about um, how the effect on the tariffs on the consumer could really offset a lot of what's been rolled out with tax relief. So there seems to be a lot of good news priced in, but there seems to be a lot of uncertainty too. There's a lot of questions about uh, global growth, you know, ongoing concerns about the measured slowdown in China, about lack of um, inflationary stimulus in Europe in spite of all the monetary stimulus. And you know the big effect in the U.S. of how uh, the corporate tax relief you know is uh, is fully priced in and potentially fading. Uh, as we're entering now 2020, there's a tremendous amount of uncertainty in U.S. politics. Uh, what's going to be you know with um, impeachment uncertainty, uh, with the outcome of the election, uh, how U.S. government debt levels are increasing so much. You know what that's going to mean for uh, the implications on rates. Uh, what it means for foreign buyers of U.S. Treasuries, uh, you know, how are they going to digest all this? Um, how is the stock market uh, handling this? If potentially is there going to be a repricing of rates going forward in 2020? Uh, what is the Fed going to do in an election year? What are other creative ways are global central banks going to do to, you know, help um, navigate through the next uh, slowdown? 
and just other, other idiosyncratic events, uh, potential uh, repo rate spikes that we saw recently, implications of Brexit, uh, the list goes on. So the point is, the point being in 2020, um, while a lot of people think the base case is, you know, the quest for yield, uh, the bid for risk assets, there seems to be a lot of um, important navigating through troubled waters. And what we hope to get uh, insight from today's panel is how our panelists are going to be looking at, you know, what are these alpha opportunities and, um, and what, is, um, what is ahead of us. So maybe uh, to kick us off, uh, we'd like to hear from Louisa, from uh, your perspectives as a global allocator, given that you get to choose across uh, multiple um, asset classes and vehicles, and you know, with your top-down perspective and your longer-term horizon, what excites you about uh, the markets today? Well, um, you just listed a very long list of things to be concerned about. Um, I actually, though, am, am pretty bullish. I think, um, you know, there's a lot of troubling aspects out there. You, you touched on, on most of them. Um, but there always are, right? When we look at things globally and as economies change and go through, especially when you think about um, the immense change that we're ha that's happening so quickly right now across the globe. Um, you know, headlines don't always read glowingly. Um, and that's part of the challenge of, of today's um, backdrop, both globally and sort of economically, when you look at the U.S., when you look at China, the tariffs, the, you know, political landscape. But with that, all that said, um, things are still really okay, right? The, the U.S. in particular, the U.S. consumer is very, very strong. Um, there was a big article in today's journal, hopefully most of you saw that, just on, on the implications of the yield curve. And now it's sort of reinverted itself. And maybe that's an indication that we're not going into recession after all. Um, so we may be in a benign situation where it's lower for longer. We may have sort of a bunch of mini recessions, so to speak, where you know you have manufacturing slowing down because of the tariff impacts, et cetera. But overall, we still continue to move forward. So we um, at, at Chilton Trust, our approach has always been that we don't have to be allocated to every single asset class. It's it's much more bespoke. It's much more you know sort of. Um, very specific, we can lean into particular areas. In the past, we've um, been the beneficiaries of leaning into the U.S. Um, across equities, credit, private, et cetera. Um, and so I think we would continue to, to you know, maintain that stance. Um, as we look at 2020, I think we're really seeing some nice green shoots in Europe. I actually just got back. I've been over there a couple times in the last month alone. And you're really starting to see private equity um, activity over there pick up, you know, especially in the UK, worries about Brexit are very real. Um, but December could show finally um, some movement forward of, you know, one way or the other, at least give investors clarity there. Um, so there's a lot of pent up demand for investment in Europe, in the UK in particular. You know, countries like Germany have been um, profoundly hard hit by our, by our tariffs. Um, so if there's resolution one way or another there, that, you know, sort of could, could provide a nice tailwind. Um, so if anything, we're sort of leaning a little bit more into Europe, um, while still, you know, sort of outsized in the U.S. We are treading very, very carefully in credit markets. I don't think, um, I think there's a lot of risk there. Um, I'm not convinced you're really getting paid for the risk you're taking there. Um, just in the pursuit of yield, I think it's challenging. So we're looking for sort of niche opportunities um, across asset classes, but really, you know, we've, we've cranked our bar as far as um, expectations really high um, to get sort of new, new positions approved um, because you just really have to be, you know, very careful in today's markets. Sihan, I'd love to hear your perspective as a discretionary global macro manager where your process involves uh, actively trading uh, global liquid markets. Uh, what do you see, maybe before we get into the, a trade-specific idea, how does the environment um, today lend itself for your type of trading in terms of active management in global markets? Um, I, I think as you put it uh, very well, there is 
this debate in the market, mainly whether the recent uh, interest rate cut, 75 basis point cut from the Federal Reserve and also monetary stimulus globally is enough to support the U.S. economy and global economy. Um, on, on the bullish side, people argue it's a ton of liquidity. Look at the stock market, it's reaching record high. And uh, as Luisa mentioned, the yield curve has re-steepened, it was inverted, now it's re-steepened. So that kind of uh, alleviates some of the investor concerns. Uh, but on the bearish side, I would argue, I'm more leaning towards the bearish side. I would argue, uh, you know, if you think about the U.S. economy, one third of the U.S. economy is already in recession, right? Because manufacturing sector, uh, if you look at the ISM manufacturing index, that is currently in contraction. Manufacturing jobs account for 9.5 percent of U total U.S. jobs, but if you include logistics warehouse, retail sectors that sell manufactured goods, that's 30% of U.S. economy. So that 30% U.S. economy is already in contraction. Um, and what's supporting the U.S. economy is really the consumers. Uh, but I think consumers really have not, the household sector has not really benefited much from the fiscal stimulus or the monetary stimulus. Right, we're not just talking about these 75 base points cut in interest rates, we're talking about extremely low 0% interest rate environment in the past 10 years. But if you look at the household sector in the US, in general, they have not taken advantage of this 0% interest rate environment. If you look at household debt to GDP ratio, that ratio has declined from 98% a decade ago to 74% today. And on the other hand, you also have very, very low wage growth. Right? A lot of people point to record low unemployment rate, uh, but if you look at wage growth, it's very low. In, if you adjust for inflation, uh, real wage has increased 30 basis points in 2016, uh, 90 basis points in 2017, 1.4% in 2018. This year, 2019, so far, real wage has increased about 90 basis points. So over the past four years, we have had about 90 basis points increase in real wage. Now we're just counting on U.S. consumers to continue to support the U.S. economy. Uh, I think that is, uh, uh, that is probably not going to be uh, very sustainable. So I am more leaning towards the bearish camp. Uh, same with fiscal stimulus. The corporate tax cut uh, has benefited corporate shareholders. But as we all know, 10% of Americans own 84% of U.S. stocks. So the question is, if the continuing prosperity of the top 10% Americans can support the entire U.S. economy, uh, I have, uh, I, you know, I'm very skeptical. Arthur, I'd like to hear your perspective as a systematic manager, uh, given that there's been so much, you know, flows also into systematic, how you view the current landscape as uh, exciting for your approach to trading. So, <clears throat> first of all, uh, I will make a disclaimer that as a systematic manager, I know next to nothing about the economy. So, uh, it's, not, it's just not my job to opine on it uh, in a sense that what we really do try to do is disassociate the effects of economy from the effects of markets, right? And it is absolutely true, as, as a person, I, I, I would agree with most of what you're saying. However, I think I'm more in uh, camp with Luisa in a sense that I don't see in the markets yet the uh, precipitous uh, signals that show the coming downturn. And it is not to say that they are not going to come. It's just to say that the economic downturn and the market downturn are two different animals, and timing them need to be done differently. And from a systematic perspective, we focus on the latter, meaning the market downturn. Um, and the next part, again, with the disclaimer that I already made uh, in place, um, I would voice uh, following um, opinion, uh, maybe slightly, uh, um, you know, outlandish, is I do believe this time is quite a bit different than 10 years ago or even 20 years ago at previous downturns in the following sense, globally different. We live in a very adversarial world now. 
very, very adversarial world. In 2008, we, left, we lived in a collaborative world. Central banks were collaborating together to stave off whatever the downturn is. Today, everybody is for himself, including US, including Germany, including Japan, including everybody, right? And, and it's going only more in that direction. And when it is that way, uh, there is an old joke is when you're running away from the bear, you don't need to run faster than the bear, you just need to run faster than your friend. So in that sense, US is better positioned compared to maybe some in Europe, compared to definitely a lot of the emerging markets that if a moderate size, if a moderate size slowdown happens, I believe a marginal dollar from elsewhere in the world will probably find its way to US. If a much bigger slowdown happens, then it's a different thing. So, so as a follow-up question, given your view, given your approach to trading markets, investing markets systematically, usually for the success of that type of approach, you need um, some amount of volatility, you need some amount of dispersion, lower correlations help, and you need some amount of liquidity. Do you, how do you view those um, conditions in, the, in context of vol correlation liquidity that should be conducive for the systematic approach? Right, very much so. In fact, uh, the primary focus of what we do is navigating these conditions, basically navigating risk on, risk off conditions. And the word risk has many, many definitions, most of which you already mentioned, correlations, volatilities, upside, downside, whatever. There's uh, lots of ways to define it, which is why it's interesting. And um, in our sort of narrowly defined approach and philosophy, we try to monitor objective metrics of risk, and we try to basically navigate those as opposed to some more interpretative metrics, such as you know um, a lot of the stuff that Sihan mentioned, which are true, I just don't know what it means today, right? And being systematic, and having a disciplined but a little bit shorter time scale, and by shorter I don't mean daily or high frequency, I mean we, we like navigate more months, yeah. right? But nonetheless, it is shorter than a lot of the fundamental approaches. So you just have to attune whatever signals you are watching with whatever time horizon you are trading for. And hopefully it works. Louise, I'd like to get your perspectives on before when you were talking about private markets and private equity, about your focus on you think there's a lot more value in the smaller niche type um, strategies and perhaps you might be avoiding the broader infrastructure type deals. I'd love to hear you know your thoughts on that opportunity set. Yeah, I mean, I think um, a couple of the earlier panels touched on this dynamic too, right? The amount of dry powder that's out there. Um, and then there, it be, so you have you know the, the large shops out there that have raised just billions and billions of dollars. So the numbers of dry powder are in the trillions now, but there's a whole hierarchy, right, of sort of um, companies buying each other and, and buying other portfolio companies and then secondaries within private equity, etc. Um, and so the most expensive deals tend to sort of come where the most dry powder is, right? It's just it's the nature of the way it works mathematically. Um, so really, as you go down sort of the hierarchy, and if you can get into these sort of, call it smaller, mid-cap, niche players, really there's um, sort of, the, the pricing is a little bit more friendly. Um, you don't have the same multiple expansion going into the initial deal. There's a lot of operational improvements that, that companies can make because these are often smaller companies that are being purchased, you know, for the very first time in insti into institutional hands out of a family-owned business. So the operational efficiencies to be had are much more significant. And then you have multiple ex exit points, right? You have sort of, you know, the public equity markets, but more likely it's either a strategic or another fund. So it's really um, where we're finding, you know, the, the greatest sources of potential alpha that remain out there. <coughs> Um, because more broadly, you really do need to bring down your return expectations relative to the past, certainly the past couple of years, if not the past decade, um, just based on where multiples are today. Um, but there are, if you, if you do the work and you find sort of these niche managers, 
Um, there are very significant opportunities out there. You just have to really, it, it takes a lot more work to find them. And um, within the private markets, uh, how about like a private uh, debt markets? Is that something that's uh, being more challenging to find good opportunities in? Or? I, yeah, I, I am finding it very challenging in, in credit in general and, and the private debt markets. There's just a lot of, you know, and there are a lot, it's a lot of capital chasing the same deals. Um, again, if you go down, you know, sort of down market and, and sort of into niche deals, you can find some, but it's, it's very, very challenging. At least my, my team and I have found it very challenging to really, if you maintain your investment scruples um, and your expectations um, without, there's just too much. If you look at these CLOs and they're already starting to show signs of, fatigue, right? And covenant light or covenant, no covenant deals are everywhere. Um, and that's a real problem. And that's a problem waiting to happen. And we need to be paying very close attention to that. Um, it's kind of the, you know, the we work dynamic in, in the private equity, in the private credit space. It's just, it's very real. People have been very willing to, you know, throw what should be good standard covenants out the window. Um, and that bleeds down throughout the whole sort of credit spectrum. So it's just worth being very careful. Yeah. Sihan, I'd like to get your um, perspectives, given your approach uh, in trading global macro markets. Um, for the macro manager, typically uh, the opportunities have been in uh, rates and currency trading. It's been, uh, till now, a pretty challenging uh, part of the sandbox to play in, because when you think about it, um, like a macro trader's favorite uh, expressions are usually uh, the G3 or the, the major currency markets, which currency vol has been uh, trading really, really low. Uh, there seems to be very little dispersion also among currencies lately. Um, what opportunities uh, within currencies uh, do you find really interesting now into 2020? Uh, well, you know, w w w when we think about uh, opportunities um, going forward, we we'll as I mentioned, I sort of have a bearish view on, on the economy. Um, but let's say if I'm run, I would like to build a portfolio with ideas. Even if I'm run, I will not lose much money. And one of the opportunities, I think, is in uh, Canadian dollar. Uh, I'm pretty bearish on Canadian dollar versus US dollar. And uh, let's say if what I just mentioned is completely wrong, US economy is going to start to boom and the Federal Reserve will not cut interest rates again, maybe in six months time they're gonna reverse, start to increase interest rates. What's gonna happen is that will be very supportive for US dollar because US interest rates will start to go up and that will help US dollar. Uh, but let's say if what I earlier described mater materialized, that's what's gonna continue to happen, which is economic slowdown continues or maybe it gets even worse. Uh, what's going to happen is I think Canadian dollar is going to sell off as well because Canadian economic cycle is highly correlated with the US and this year so far Canada is the best performing G10 currency. It's up about 4% um, Why it's the best performing currency because after the oil price collapsed in 2014-2015 Bank of Canada was very aggressive cutting interest rates so what happened was as they cut interest rates very aggressively, Canadian economy started to recover. So this year, when everyone is cutting interest rates, worried about disinflation risk, Canada is actually doing pretty well. Their GDP is doing well. Their inflation, 2%, is actually at their central bank target. So that's what has been supporting Canadian dollar, and it has performed really well. But my view is that the economic cycle between US and Canada are highly correlated because when you think about Canada, all, Canadian, all Canadians live within 100 miles from the U.S. border. If U.S. is not doing well, then Canada is not going to do very well. And Canadian economy is very export sensitive. Right? The number one trading partner with, with um, Canada is U.S. Number, one, number two trading partner for Canada is China. And we know both economies are slowing down. And Canadian economy is also very oil driven, right? Canadian currency is a commodity currency, it's driven by oil price. And oil price, we all know the long term challenges with electric cars, uh, shale, um, insufficient demand. But in the near term, we also have a lot of challenge, which is, you know, the demand is really not there for oil price. And the last 
uh, concern, which I think is also very, very important to consider, is the housing market. A lot of people have talked about the Canadian housing market. Uh, it has slowed down. Home prices have stopped rising. It's sort of flattish. Uh, home sales are softening. Uh, but if you look at the home price increase over the past few years, it has been very, very rapid, especially in those metropolitan cities like Toronto and uh, Vancouver. Now the international buyers are not there anymore because the global economy is slowed down. Domestic buyers, Canadian household has a lot of leverage, a lot of debt. Canadian household debt to GDP ratio is 100% compared to 74% here in the US. So you are not gonna have much, many domestic buyers, you're not gonna have a lot of international buyers. I think the housing market is gonna slow down. For all these reasons, I think Canadian dollar is gonna uh, weaken converse US dollar. And again, even if I'm wrong with my economic outlook, in that case, US dollar is gonna strengthen, then Canadian dollar is probably gonna weaken versus US dollar. And in terms of expression, just the outright short Canadian dollar versus the uh, US dollar, or versus perhaps a basket of other currencies? Yeah, we, in, for that trade, we would just go with Delta One, so just do the currency forward, just short Canadian dollar versus US dollar. Arthur, uh, I'd like to get your perspective as a um, systematic manager. Um, there's so much like evolution to your systematic process. Uh, given all the flows have gone into passive, how has this affected your systematic approach to investing? Um, so in our specific approach, our philosophy has been actually to neither um, be passive or active, but in fact to recognize that different strategy styles, including passive, have their time under the sun. And it depends on the market environment. It depends on, uh, in particular from our viewpoint, from, on the risk environment. And therefore, we actually very explicitly recognize passive balanced portfolios as, let's not call it a benchmark, but a target for us. And we actively strive to outperform both passive and hedge fund targets. Now, the only way you can do that is by being dynamic. You, you can't possibly do that all the time. And um, uh, I do very much agree with Sihan about the first focus has to be, even if I'm wrong, not to lose too much money. That's PM sort of primary uh, objective. And there are, in my view, there are different approaches to do that. Um, and one approach is to properly structure the portfolio and figure out all the scenarios and so on. That's for a longer term uh, sort of viewpoint. Um, in our more tactical approach, it's a little bit more like uh, if you are driving down a windy mountain road, you can be safe by driving sufficiently slowly, or you can be safe if you have really good brakes. And then if you see a straight patch, you just barrel down there quickly if you know that you can stop enough, you know, as soon as you see visibility of the curve. So we take that second approach. We follow our systematic strategies to figure out where to switch from being more benign to more uh, sort of uh, defensive. Right now we're extremely defensive, mm -hmm. and we have been extremely defensive, meaning leaning into bonds. We don't really have a notion of a trade, but from a dominant portfolio positioning, we've been very long bonds since more than a year ago, which obviously benefited us, but we did it not because we were forecasting that the yields will come down. We did it because, not because we wanted to make more money, but we want, because we didn't want to lose more money, right? And then if risks materialize, the rest of the market comes to it and then you make money. So um, I don't know how much longer it will persist because again, us being systematic, we just take the cues from the market. And I can tell you that if the market tells us that kind of the risks are dissipating, we'll take it as a cue for the time being. Yeah. And so much of um, what you have to do as a systematic manager is identifying when alphas uh, degrade over time. Um, what sort of alpha sources have you noticed um, have been uh, suffered from alpha degradation and which have, you, which have been new additions in the approach? Well, there are many. I will mention one from my personal experience. When I, um, several years ago, uh, came back to uh, New York from working overseas and were thinking about uh, creating a fund, uh, I'm a quant 
the first thing that came to mind, high frequency trading. I looked at it, figured out the model, it had good predictability, uh, even tried to trade a little bit, very quickly realized it's not my place. Why? Because very quickly realized that even if you have a correct model, which makes correct predictions, pushing that model through the market is not sustainable because the minute somebody else is a nanosecond faster than you, just, just taking the trade before you, the trade that you knew was good, you're done, right? So, which is why we went <laughs> exactly opposite direction, went into much longer horizon strategies with an objective that, you know, I can't really try to sell our strategies to investors saying, you know what, I'm really good, but if somebody is tiny bit better than me, your, your return is gone. No, if somebody is tiny bit better than me, my return should come down just a little bit. So that's, that's one example where just a limited opportunity set and proliferation of enormous power that a lot of the firms brought to it, brought to complete sort of, uh, you know, uh, the money is still there, it's just not available to everyone, right? Um, another example, probably perennial example, is value underperformance over the last 10 years. Again, it's not like value has lost its meaning. No, it's not. Value is, by definition, value. It's just that the proliferation of money going into mega caps and other things have led to really painful long-term, long stretch of underperformance, whether it's value, whether it's CTAs, uh, but I don't think of them as done. I think they will come back. Louisa, as an absolute return longer-term investor, are you leaning into more volatility-friendly type strategies? like vol friendly strategies as we're you know talking about all these potential inflection points as we're getting closer in 2020 yeah i mean i think we've seen more recently volatility sort of creep back into the markets um which i think is sort of a welcome welcome you know moment for many of us out there with sort of the the prolonged low volatility or no volatility um and sort of by nature, the movement into passive, because that's just been the easy, correct place to be, quite frankly. Um, but as we sort of, if volatility it feels like it probably is going to be more pronounced um, going forward into 2020 and beyond, um, I think that's, that's actually a good thing. I think it's very healthy for markets. I think, um, you know, downdrafts that we get in volatile markets um, are very healthy. They create opportunities. Um, and I think I would actually advocate, a, you know, a much stronger movement into active over passive if um, that, in fact, if we have a more volatile backdrop. Um, and it's a real opportunity to sort of maybe those flows start to shift a little bit back into more active strategies and out of passive. Um, that remains to be seen because, but I think a volatile market is, is actually a good thing. Um, you don't want it to be, you know, we don't want a repeat of, of last, you know, fourth quarter of last year. That was really painful for a lot of people. But that said, sort of if you do have a long-term investment horizon, you know, who cares about last fourth quarter? It created real opportunities to, for people to reposition their portfolios and, and then have a great 2019. So if, you, if you're the longer-term sighted you are, volatility is your friend. Um, so we're really choosing to be with active managers, um, that have a little bit more concentration in their portfolios, that are not just benchmark huggers, that really have conviction in the names that they own, um, and will use volatility to their advantage. It definitely sounds like uh, our panel is very pro-active management. We all agree that volatility probably will pick up into 2020, and definitely does uh, give a place for active management. Uh, Sihan, I'd like to get your perspective on how has the environment uh, influenced, if it has, um, your trading horizon in terms of uh, investment horizons? Have you noticed um, whether it's risk-off periods are shorter lived? Um, has have there been a change in the last uh, year or so and going forward? Well, um, I think for us, um, I, I agree with what Luisa just talked about. Sort of, if you have a long-term horizon, then it's it's volatility is good for you. Um, but I think there are uh, 
investors with long-term horizon, then they can just go into private equity funds, lock up their capital, and try to aim for you know, very high returns, 20%, 30%. But for investors that would like to have liquidity, then they will essentially face this trilemma. The trilemma is they would like to get relatively high returns uh, with limited downside, uh, but at the same time, they'd like to avoid paying option premium, right? Because if you just pay option premium, you can achieve significant upside with limited downside. But the, the, the challenge with paying option premium is sometimes it becomes like a lottery ticket. So for us, it's really about building a balanced and diversified portfolio. So by diversifying the portfolio, it's not just diversification across region, across asset class. It's also diversification across time horizon. So in our portfolio, we're really trying to build, find those ideas that have different time horizons. Some of the stuff could materialize, in our opinion, relatively quickly in the next uh, you know, couple of months. Some of the ideas are a little bit longer term, uh, probably you know, three to six months. So I think that's very important uh, to have this sort of diversification, to have different ideas with different time horizons. Uh, we have just a couple of minutes left in uh, this panel. I'd like to see if um, anyone in the audience has any questions to our panelists. I'd like to open the floor for any questions. Uh, yes, please. In September, uh, the repo market have a crisis and the Fed uh, reacted dramatically. Why it's so calm in the gold market and uh, the Bitcoin market? Thank you. As if nothing happened. Because nothing happened. No, no, no. It's because I think the belief is that it was purely technical. I think the interpretation that I heard most late last one, uh, I can tell you what I was worried about. If, if at that very same time I saw Deutsche Bank stock going down, I would be freaking, okay? But none of that happened, and the more recent interpretation was there was some sort of movement of funds at JP Morgan or whatever, so which to me amounts to nothing. Now, next time, I don't know. Well, let me give you an example. In 2007, there was a blow up of a French hedge fund out of BNP, and Fed cut unexpected rates, 50 bips. Why the hell did they do that? That, that was nonsense. That was complete stupid, right? It was just a fat finger trade, right? The, 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 what was the name? It was just uh, unauth un unauthorized trade, right? So reaction of the Fed sometimes can be, you know, wrong. Now, in this case, it happened to be right, right? Uh, they, they saw the need for the cash, they deployed it, they'll withdraw it when they need it. But like I said, the action itself doesn't tell you the story. You need to understand what's the context of the action. So if that action was happening because of like a real strain of some, some big player really needing the money, that would be a totally different story. No, it was technical, and I, I, I mean, I do think it, did, it caught the Fed off guard too, right? It, I mean, everybody was sort of caught off guard by that, the repo market. But, um, but it was a technical rather than sort of an absolute and sort of a situation here to stay. Can I just comment quickly? Because um, I work for a bank and we trade repo, so I was, we do a lot of repo. Oh, so it is not, um, the Fed, it, it certainly is maybe a longer term issue than it might appear right now, but the Fed... Um, uh, had a survey and they went to all the big banks and tried to determine what the ideal excess reserve situation should be. And I think that as a consequence of their fact-finding and survey, they kind of screwed up a little bit. So the plumbing is a very important component and they haven't figured it out yet. So, but I don't know if it's completely over and we'll see going forward because it, we're in a new a new world with QE, et cetera. So a lot of things are very different, yield curves, 
excess reserves, O globally, et cetera. So just to point out, I just wanted to yeah. add that. Thank Sorry. you. So just um, in the interest of time, uh, that uh, concludes our current panel. I want to thank our panelists and uh, thank you, Barrel Elites.